this is probably going to be pretty heavy and I don't know how it's going to come out but I just had a greater understanding of what's going on here and how the angel of death is the good guy even if he gets rid of 75 to 90 percent of the people he's still doing everyone a favor by cutting the tie and getting rid of the ballast weight throwing the ballast weight overboard Shaving off the barnacles on the boat that are slowing the whole boat down, that are going to sink the whole ship, the parasites that are draining the life force energy from the hosts. Then it first came to me with the thoughts about the paying it forward. Someone asked, someone said, great video, how do I donate to you? I just thought, you don't donate to me. And as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, you can pay it forward to someone else. You can do a good deed for someone else. And in that way, it will make its way back around to me by you doing your part to help create a better world of happier people for me to live within. You doing a good deed for someone else will make them happy and more likely to do a good deed for someone else and make them happy. And on the cycle goes back around to me. So make your donation to me if you appreciate what I do by doing something good for someone else. And then it will make its way back around to me eventually. That's the idea of the movie Pay It Forward. And I've always been that guy. Like under a scenario that I came up with, like we're on an airplane, you know, when the masks drop down and they say, put the mask on yourself before you tend to your children. Because you have to be able to breathe in order to help your children. I've had this analogy since I was a teenager that I'm the kind of guy that if there's a limited amount of oxygen, I don't say, well, I got to breathe. I got to look out for me first because I can't help anyone else unless I'm okay and I'm good. i got to keep my bank account full before I can donate to anyone else. I've had this idea that I would take that one can of air that we have left and take a breath and pass it around and then take a breath and pass it around until we either find another air canister or we all run out of air together. It's the same idea as paying it forward. Creating a better world for us all to live in. The, the plan of happiness is the plan for the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people. And this is why the angel of death is the good guy. And that's why, down at the art museum, I'll include the link in the description where I paid my first visit to the art museum and recorded it, there is a painting called The Triumphant Return of Christ. And it shows a guy on a, on a horse with a sword in his hand slaying the wicked and that's what it said is Jesus is going to come back to slay the wicked he's not going to be the same Jesus that you remember coming around the first time but it's the same guy two different angels if you will operating under the same God to promote the same plan for the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people and I know some people that are ready to do this my boy Sean over there in Spanish Fork by the way three people took the lobe squeeze challenge in the last week and realize that I'm not uh, delusional. So he's one of them. <laughs> and in his last text message to me, he invited me to go hang out this Sunday. Said something to the effect of how these people around us, I don't remember exactly how he worded it, but it sounds like he's ready to pull the levers on those dragons like I said I was ready to on the way back from independence. And then I came to the understanding that you don't have to actually pull the levers on the dragon to slay all those people that deserve it. You just got to be willing to in a real way in order that you're not mad at God when God does it. In, your, in order that you'll see that angel of death as the good guy who did us all a favor, who did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So if you want to donate to me, do for someone else what they can't do for themselves in that moment, whether it's doing their dishes or watching their kids or cleaning their house. Whatever you see that you can do, with whatever means you have available to you, make the world a better place in whatever way you can, in your own little space, in your own little bubble, in your own little sphere of influence. Do something good for someone else to maximize the, uh, the ability that you have to do whatever you can for whoever you can. If you see that I can do this really easily, and that person can't hardly do it at all, so I'll just take five minutes to do that for them, because they can't seem to do it for themselves, even if it's something simple. So if and when that angel of death slays 75 to 90 percent of the population here, would you, are you capable of seeing that as a good thing? 
because 75 to 90 percent of the people are not. They'll say, oh, that's the bad guy. Yeah. Because they are in that mushy middle. Like I said, there's 10% on the side of the righteous, 10% on the side of the truly wicked, and 80% in the mushy middle that we're going to have to just plow right through in order to get to the wicked and wipe them out. The opposite of good is not evil. The opposite of good is indifferent. Like, I don't care either way. It doesn't matter to me. That's what indifferent means. Or apathy. You don't care either way. Mask, no mask, that doesn't really matter to me. Vax, no vax, doesn't really matter to me. The people that have spent their life living like there's no tomorrow, like there is no God, like there will be no accountability in this life after you're done, pray that there is no tomorrow. And as they see the things happening around us and they're coming to recognize, oh, maybe some of those things in the Bible were right and there is going to be an accountability, like in the movie Defending Your Life, but the people that have lived as if there will be no accountability, as if there is no heaven or hell, as if this world is all there is, after they've lived their whole life in that way, they hope there's no tomorrow. They hope there's no heaven or hell. They hope there's no accountability because they've lived their whole life as if they'll never have to be held accountable for the things they've done during their life. So they hope that there's no afterlife because of what they've done in this life. <clears throat> And so as far as me being ready to jump on those dragons and pull the levers myself and realizing, well, you don't actually have to actually do that. You just got to get to the point where you're ready and willing to do that and do it yourself in order that you're not mad at God when God does it. And it occurred to me just now. That if God would do the choosing, he would point out that's a wheat. That's a tear. That's a sheep. That's a goat. That's a good guy. That's a bad guy. By the way, they told us the sheep are the good guys and the goats are the bad guys. We'll deal with that later. That's an inversion of reality because as you see what's going on around us, the sheep are the ones that are just going along to get along, following the leader in front of them. The Judas goat, I think it's more like the Judas sheep. <clears throat> and there's this thing about the goats. Trump just called... Evander Holyfield, the greatest of all time, G-O-A-T. People are like, oh, that's a satanic Luciferian reference to the goat, the Baphomet. If you look at behavior patterns, not symbolism, it's function over form, substance over style, principles over personalities. Get rid of those labels and actually look at the function of the goat and the function of the sheep. And then superimpose that analogy of behavior patterns onto the people. And do you want to be put with the sheep that are going along to get along? They're just going to go along with whatever. They're indifferent. Doesn't matter to me. Mask, no mask. Vax, no vax. Or the rambunctious, rebellious goats that aren't running around in flocks, but are independent, rambunctious, wild. The good slaves love the good book. A rebel loves a cause. So it occurred to me <clears throat> that if God would do, while well, I was kind of having one of these, you know, interactions with the Spirit, <clears throat> if God would do the choosing and tell me, because I can't see in their hearts, I don't know their whole life, everything they've ever done, and the thoughts they had and the feelings they had while they were doing this, or choosing not to do anything. But if God would point out, okay, that one's good, that one's bad, would I do the pulling of the levers and slay them? Probably but I don't have the ability to choose. But what if I did? If I had the access to the Akashic Records and I knew everything they did in their entire life, including the thoughts and the feelings they had while they were doing it, would I be willing and capable of not only executing, but making the decision and taking the responsibility of who I decided, who lives and who dies? If I had full access to everything they ever did and thought, yes, I would be willing to not only make the choice of who lives and who dies, but follow through with the action. Because I've lived my life searching for truth, trying to create the better world, that utopian pay it forward world, where everyone is equal. Not because we chop off all the tallest trees and cut everyone down to size like in the communism we understand, that they're trying to create that type of equality, but a world in which 
everyone was looking for someone that they could help. As soon as someone falls a little bit, everyone around them comes and lifts them back up. And they spend their life not trying to I, me, mine, get myself forward, but looking around for anyone who might be falling behind a little that I can help up a little. Like in a family unit. That's what family does for each other. Any one of the family members that starts to fall, the rest of the family members rally around in support to keep them afloat. But then there's some family members who just kind of rely on the goodwill of the other family members as a safety net. I can fall, everyone else will pick up my slack. We need good shipmates on this boat, not a bunch of barnacles clinging to the side. They're ballast weight. And because I have spent my entire life coming to truly know what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, and decipher and devise my own understanding of how to create a better world and trying to do what I can in whatever way I can in my own little sphere of influence, yes, I would be capable of making the decision and executing the action. <clears throat> and it's only because I've spent my entire life trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong and do it. Because what's right and what's wrong, what's a good code of conduct is very unique to each person and their own personal, unique like life experiences. So it's up to each one of us in the moment as action is happening, as the world is happening around us, to decide what's right and what's wrong in this unique situation with my family members or with my boss or with my coworkers. Because each one of us has such unique life experiences, there is no uniform code of conduct that would fit universally for all of us. So I have spent my life trying to decide what's truly good and right, not self-serving idea of what's right and what's wrong and what's good. That's what most people do. And they come up with a code of conduct that fits their behavior rather than have their behavior conform to a universal code of conduct that would actually make the world a better place. They make a code of conduct that makes the world a better place in accordance with their own behavior to declare everything that they have done as good and right. But instead, I have tried to come up with an understanding of some principles that we could live by, or the, at least that I could live by, that is good and right and true and makes the world a better place. Even if that means I myself am going to get cut from the tree of life, I would be willing to do that to myself. In order to make the world a better place, if I haven't adhered to a code of conduct that actually makes the world a better place, then yes, I need to be eliminated. It is from that mindset that I've been searching for this truth, this underlying set of priorities and principles and standards of behavior that we could all adhere to. And having developed some understanding of that kind of a universal code of conduct, not a self-serving set of ideas that means I'm a good person, but a truly universal set of ideals that would actually make the world a better place, that I myself would have to hold myself up to that same standard, and whenever and wherever I fall short, I myself would have to experience the consequence of falling short. That means if I deserve to get slayed along with the wicked in order to make the, the world a better place, so be it. I have been willing to sacrifice my own comfort and convenience, or even my own survival. And that is what this pressure cooker we're under it right now is. Trying to get more people to come to that point where they're willing to sacrifice their own comfort and convenience. Go to jail. Do whatever it takes to draw the line. And say, okay, it's time that I stand for something. Something meaningful. Rather than just go along to get along in a self-serving way that creates the most comfort and convenience for me which means go take your vaccine and then you can go back to doing life as usual. And this pressure cooker that we're being put under right now, I'm willing to endure for a little bit longer in order to give more people the chance to let their light shine. The darkness is descending and it needs to last for as long as possible so as many people as possible have that come to Jesus moment and realize this ain't a world worth living in. I will sacrifice myself. Go ahead and kill me if that's what it takes. Because I'm not willing to live in this kind of a world. 
And if it takes setting the example or just simply extracting myself from this world and letting myself experience the consequences of standing for these principles rather than going along with whatever's happening, so be it. This pressure cooker we're being put under is letting the darkness descend upon us. Farther and farther, for longer and longer period of time, so more and more people might come to that place where they draw the line and say, that's it. This is unacceptable. I'm not willing to live in this kind of a world, and not in, only for self-serving purposes, because self-servingly, it's more comfortable and convenient for you to go along with whatever new mandates and regulations come, come your way. But in principle... For future generations, or for those around us that aren't capable of standing up for themselves, those of us that can stand up for the truth and what is right, must come to be able to willing, be willing to do so. And the longer this pressure cooker goes on, the calm before the storm, it gives more and more of these flowers an opportunity to bloom. And I know a lot of us are getting to the point where we're like, let's do this already. For those that don't get it yet, they never will. It's time to put their light out. But in order that they might let it shine in the darkness, we let the darkness continue to grow and fester and get worse and worse and create a world less and less worth living in until more and more of those people decide that they will stand for a set of principles and that Going along to get along is a self-serving way of conveniently blending yourself into the herd like zebras in their stripes. They don't blend in with anything in the Serengeti Desert or the Sahara or the desert where those zebras live. The reason they have the stripes is so they can blend in with the other herd of zebras. And the safest place is in the middle of the pack of zebras. There are those of us that are willing to go clear out to the edge and take the hit of the lion first in order, rather than blending into the herd and trying to huddle into the middle and get further and further into the middle as we're all getting squashed into a smaller and smaller flock. There's some of us that aren't sheep and we'll go stand right out there at the edge in order to be the first target that the lion gets his teeth on. Rather than living in a world where we all got to go into a smaller and smaller circle and everyone's seeking their own safety, so they're trying to get closer and closer to the center of the herd. So this pressure cooker is giving more and more people a chance to bloom and let their light shine. And for that reason, I'm willing to endure it a little bit longer. Because I can see that when the angel of death comes along and slays those who would not stand for something... Like the saying goes, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And the people that are falling for all of this are doing so because they never stood for anything. Much like that analogy I just made of people that lived as if there will be no consequence after death, actually hope at this point that there is no afterlife. Because if there is, that means for them personally, they've got a big debt to pay. So they hope there is no accountability. It said that Jesus will come back to slay the wicked. Slay anyone who does not worship him. That means anyone who is not in alignment with truth. To be in alignment with truth, that doesn't mean create a set of principles that aligns with your own behavior to declare yourself in alignment with truth. That means truly understand truth, even if it means you're exposing the places where you've been a liar or a cheat or you haven't done your best. Most people have a self-serving idea of what is true and what is right and what is real. And that's why those who took the vax will never be able to reconsider whether or not this was all legit because it would be more self-serving for them to forever thereafter believe in what the official story was because they personally took the vax. It would take a real big person to reconsider whether or not this was all legit after you took that vax. It's a form of mind control that you injected into your arm. From that point forward, you'll never again be able to reconsider what was true and what was right and what was real in a truly uh, objective way. 
It will be subjective in accordance with your own actions and behaviors. And because you took the facts, you'll never again be able to reconsider whether or not that was necessary, whether or not we got fooled and lied to. You'll always say, oh no, it was right and it was true because your personal attachment to the outcome of that investigation or assessment of what's right and wrong and true. You want yourself to be right and true so you'll always believe that this was all legit and all above board and you'll never be able to reconsider. Likewise, people that went along to get along with 9-11 and the official story are a big majority of those that can't question authority now because they went along with it then. So now they have to continue believing in the authorities because otherwise they'd have to reconsider what all those conspiracy theorists said about that war on terror. And each time we have one of these opportunities to do what's right or just go along with whatever's most convenient and comfortable, it separates us into two groups. Those who are in alignment with truth, even if it's a self-sacrifice to be in alignment with truth when the rest of the group goes this way and you stand here in alignment with truth, you're on the outside of that zebra herd. You're going to get hit by the lion first, like the Japanese say. The nail that stands up the highest gets hit on the head first. And so as the hammer's coming down all around us, those that are willing to keep standing up rather than try and duck lower and lower than anybody else so that I don't get hit on the head and say, fuck it, hit me. This ain't a world worth living in if we all got to dodge the hammer every day. In that way, this pressure cooker is good the longer it goes because it gives more and more of those people an opportunity as they keep having to duck lower and lower to dodge that hammer, they might come to a point where they say, okay, enough's enough. And those are the ones that are going to let their light shine that don't have to be slayed because God don't want to slay them. God wants as many of them to stand up for what's right and what's true as possible before he has to level the, level the field. Before the reaper has to come along and harvest, he wants as many as possible to come to that point where they let their light shine and truly live in alignment with truth and stand up for what's right and are even willing to sacrifice themselves. A blacksmith, when he puts the steel in the fire and then pounds it with the hammer and then puts the steel in the fire and then pounds it with the hammer, that turns that iron into tempered steel and it's much stronger tinsel strength within the, the material itself afterwards, a blacksmith. So he, uh, fire, heat, and then pressure, with the hammer. And each time he does that, little sparks fly off. Those are the impurities within the steel. And the steel comes out more pure, just like a distillation process that removes the impurities from the whiskey by putting it through the heat and the pressure. Removing the water, you can put it through a freeze distillation process that removes the water and separates the water from the whiskey and then just take the water off the top and you're left with much more potent whiskey, much more pure whiskey. A distillation process. A refinement process. We are being refined right now. And so the longer we allow for the heat and the pressure to keep being applied, the more impurities fly out. And on this consciousness farm, the more consciousness might wake up and let their light shine because the darkness is getting so dark and more dark and more dark. Eventually, more and more people might have that opportunity to demonstrate mastery in some of these areas of character that up until now, they haven't practiced enough. I've said it a few times now, those who haven't practiced thinking for themselves aren't going to be able to do so now, now that it's game time and it really matters. If you haven't been practicing for 20 years and we're on the field and this is the truther bowl, those that haven't practiced aren't going to be able to just suddenly start competing with the rest of us in this super truther bowl. But those that are on the line and might have a little something left in them, a little spark left in them that they could blow on and get a little flame to pop up from it. This heat and this pressure and this darkness that's descending upon us <clears throat> is giving them more and more opportunity and reason to do so. But if they choose not to, then they will be extinguished. And God doesn't want to extinguish them. He wants them to let their light shine. And so this darkness that descends upon us, all this heat and pressure that's being applied to refine the consciousness within the Petri dish is getting more and more cells 
within the Petri dish, individuals, to take a side, to draw the line and say, I'm on the side of the righteous. It doesn't matter what happens to me personally. In the name of creating a better world, I will not stand for this. And it, even if it is not for myself so that I can live in a better world, for all those around me and for future generations, I cannot stand for this. Because for anyone who's just, ah, I'm only here for a couple more decades, if I can just squeeze out another couple decades with a little, little more comfort and a little more convenience, so what if I got to take a vax or do some mandates or show my papers wherever I go? And this is also why when the angel of death comes, that's the good guy, believe it or not. And even if he slays 75 to 90% of the population, he's still the good guy. 75 to 90% of the population won't think so because their idea of what's true and good is in alignment with whatever they've behaved, their own standards of behavior. They then form a set of principles and priorities that align with their own standards of behavior where their actual underlying priorities and principles were self-serving, whatever's most convenient and comfortable and benefits me at the time. We are going to a world that's more like that family unit where everyone looks around for those around them and sees who's fallen and goes over and lifts them up and seeks to maximize the benefit that they can provide for the others in the family using whatever they have. If I only have $100 or if I have a skill set, I look around for the ways that I can maximize the benefit to others that I can create with my own life force essence, my own time, effort, energy, and resources. Find the best way that I can apply those in order to maximize the benefit that will be produced for others within the group. That is a communism that is in alignment with, not in alignment with what we've ever known. It's the opposite of the economy we know now. I've called it the love economy. I've been describing this for a while. The economy we know now is to give as little as possible and take as much as possible in each transaction. And the difference between the two is your profit margin. And you're always trying to expand your profit margin. Give a little less, take a little more in each transaction and you maximize your profit margin a little more. And there's never a point at which you've gone a little too far. Maybe you should take a little less and give a little more even though you st and you'll still have enough. It's never enough. From the mindset of the world we live in now, it's never enough. We've been conditioned to take as much as possible and give as little as possible, and then our relationships with other people become transactional. Even when we're considering marrying another person, are you marrying up or marrying down, is one of the terminologies people apply. Like, is she out of your league? Is he out of your league? Everyone wants to marry up, like a caste system in India. Except they take into account someone's finances and their abilities and decide, how much can I get out of this relationship? And how much will I have to give in order to maximize my profit margins in this personal relationship? I don't think I want to be your friend. Why? Poor people, they don't have any rich friends. Because rich friend, rich people don't associate with poor people. Because you might call me and ask me for a favor. I like my friends to be rich people. That way they have as much money as me and they won't ask me for any favors. So... That angel of death that is coming to purify and refine the culture and the consciousness is going to get rid of a large percent of the population. Let's just say 75 to 90%. That's what the remnant is. In the Bible, it speaks of a remnant, a very small portion, a very small percentage of the population that remains after the rest are cleared out. Those are the purities, all the impurities of the culture. Right now, they're getting spit out right and left because the heat and the pressure, like the blacksmith. But pretty soon, there's going to be a wholesale clearing of all the impurities that didn't decide to let their consciousness shine for and stand for something greater than themselves. To be the change you wish to see in the world wasn't a suggestion. It was an ultimatum. You are going to be in a world with people just like yourself. That the person that you be is the change that you're going to see in the world. After we separate 
the goats with the goats and the sheeps with the sheeps and the pieces of shit with the pieces of shit and the rapists with the rapists and the murders with the murders. Everyone gets separated into a group of people just like themselves. So be the change that you wish to see in the world. Wasn't like some utopian ideal that will never come about. It's what happens during the separation process when you get put into a world with people like yourself who act in accordance with priorities and principles that are in alignment with yours. So the longer this pressure goes on, the longer this darkness descends and the darker it gets, the more of a chance and the more of an opportunity these people have to let their light shine. <clears throat> but those who don't, The person doing the job that's executing the action that can see in their heart that knows everything they've ever done is acting in accordance with the plan of happiness for the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people. Getting rid of those family members that decided to just rest on the safety net of the goodwill of those people around them. Getting rid of the consumers that are just resting on the producers. Getting rid of the parasite that's resting on the host. Getting rid of the uh, decomposers that are only alive because of the composers that create and produce and contribute to a better world. While others discover more and more ways that they can consume and take more and give less. Now is the ultimate opportunity for a lot of people to decide to give something and do something. Even if it means sacrificing your own freedom, your own comfort, your own convenience, everyone's getting a chance to show their true colors is what I said on the way out to Missouri. That everyone's getting a chance to show their own true colors and at the time, it didn't mean anything to anyone. Now, we can see that's exactly what's happening. Everyone's getting a chance to show their true colors. And so the longer this goes on, the more of a chance more people get to shine. And so for that reason, I'm willing to allow it to happen a little bit longer. But when it does happen and the clearing happens, don't have survivor's guilt. Know that that is in alignment with the plan of happiness for the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people. Even if it's only a small percentage of us that are left in this particular Petri dish, those others will be happier in a Petri dish full of people just like themselves. Because at that point, they'll be given even more opportunity and reason to raise the bar and let their light shine and not just go along with whatever everyone else is doing once they're in a Petri dish full of people that are all pieces of shit, that are all consumers, that are all sponges that uh, absorb the life force essence of those around them. They'll realize it which doesn't take much for me to raise the bar in this level of a Petri dish. Because the level of consciousness, the consensus reality and conventional wisdom has come to such a low, all they got to do is come up a little bit and they're at the top of the pack. And they realize in principle, I can make this world a better place by just not being a total piece of shit. That's lowering the bar for them, giving them a greater opportunity to raise the bar within the community by lifting their own standards of behavior, establishing some personally relevant and personally meaningful priorities and principles by which they conduct their own life in order to set the standard and demonstrate what it means to make the world a better place. Once they're in a world full of pieces of shit like themselves, the bar will be lowered so far that they can really rise and shine. But when they're in a world where they feel like they're already somewhere in the middle toward the bottom of the pack, they don't feel like they're competent or uh, confident enough to rise to the top. They don't feel like they're even close to being the cream of the crop that could rise to the top. But when they're put in a Petri dish full of pieces of shit like themselves, they'll realize, man, it don't take much. I could really raise the standards and demonstrate what it means to behave in a way that creates a better world for all of us. Just by not doing what everyone else is doing in this Petri dish full of pieces of shit. I can just not go along with what everyone else is doing. Tradition. Set the standard of a new tradition that makes the world a better place. Demonstrate what it means to be a good person. That way, you can be the change you wish to see in the world. And on the next separation, you'll level up. But at this point, we're getting real close. But the pressure cooker is on in order that a few more people might decide to stand for something. 
in order to be the change that they wish to see in the world, the bar has been lowered so far and the hammer's coming down so hard so many times in so many places. It doesn't take much for a person to stand for something in this kind of environment. But the person who doesn't stand for something in these conditions and circumstances deserves to be extracted and done away with and have their light snuffed out. And as you can see, that's the majority of the population. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this condition. We wouldn't be in this circumstance if a good number of people stood for something. But they don't. That's why most of them are going to get wiped out. And it is for the greater purpose of the evolution of this consciousness to create the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people to get rid of most of those people that won't even stand for something in a world that's descended as far as ours has and they still won't stand for something. Getting rid of them is necessary to promote and perpetuate life, consciousness, spirit. Otherwise, we all devolve into empty husks, these shells of a physical body that no longer have any spirit, any freedom, any joy, any individuality, any principles. We just do whatever we're told in a world where, well, let's just say, you can see that most of the people aren't going to make it through this filtration. At least not to where some of us are going to make it. And out the other side, it doesn't matter what happens. You stand for something here and now in this life. And on the other side, you will be greatly rewarded tenfold for everything you've done. And so will they. In that separation, that's what happens.